happier those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path of that sinner's tree, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. On this, and on, the, on his law, they meditate day and night. They're like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season. And their leaves do not wither, and all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Luke 14, 25-33 Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned to, and said, to them, whoever comes with me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build the tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish. All who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is so far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your positions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks, God. Quadra <laughs> and grits. Somebody told me, a uh, preacher who's got a lot more experience than I do, said sometimes a, a text can be so personal or so enveloping, there's so many ways you can come at it, and it can get so personal that you can't really adequately prepare a sermon and have something. You just got to get up there and just talk about it. That guy's name is David Carlson. And when he said that, I thought, I, I nodded my head, I said, okay, but, but inwardly I'm thinking, that's not a very good that doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. But today, that's what I, I've got. I found myself this week as I was meditating on this text, hating mother and father. Why does Jesus say things like this? And uh, all of a sudden, I started watching this show on Netflix called Chef's Table. I don't know if any of you have seen Chef's Table. I love, I love to cook, and I love cooking shows. And there's this one that is about a woman named Mashama Bailey, and she's from Savannah, Georgia. And I started watching this program, and I've watched it four or five, six times this week. And then I spent hours, probably 20 hours, cutting and pasting clips for you. Because Jesus always got his point across by telling stories. I want to tell a story, and I want to follow Mashama's story this morning, if you will. Um, and I found myself, you know, guys, we're not supposed to have feelings at all. I was supposed to cry, and you know, I found myself weeping all week in tears watching this program, and I'm wondering what is it about this program, and I knew it pretty quickly. It's because it's it's my home, it's where I'm from. Savannah is not where I'm from, but from Jacksonville, which is an hour south, and the topography and the river and the scenery, and then the feelings that she evokes in here just absolutely stirred my soul all week this week. And I started thinking about this text, too, in the context of this. And I thought, why does Jesus have to say hate? Why does he say hate your mother or father? This is where the good preacher comes in and says, hey, don't worry. The Greek word, in the Greek, actually, it means to mildly find annoying. Okay, well, that's easier. Unfortunately, no, it's hate. It's hate. That's the word. That's the, that's, that's the translation. But Jesus doesn't hate his own father. And so what do we take out of this? What do we get out of this? 
I see this as foie gras and grits. And you'll see in Mashama's story, and my story, and I don't know, is this partly your story too? Hating mother and father, I think Jesus uses those strong terms because it's hard to leave the nest. A lot of times mom has to kick us out of the nest, you know, or we'll stay in the basement for the rest of our lives. I think Jesus uses strong words because we have to find our own individual spiritual journey. And it can't be moms and it can't be dads. Most indigenous societies still have initiation rites. The boys are separated from the girls at 12 or 13. And tribal elders, women take the girls, men take the men, and they're taken away from mom and dad, and they're raised to become spiritually responsible, mature adults and members of the community. For us in the West, a lot of times that's going off to college, uh, joining the military, something that takes us away from home. There's something that Jesus says we've got to have an experience of leaving home in order to come back to home. And we've got to leave home to long for home, too. I'm just going to comment as we go through. There's about four or five video clips that I want to share with you. Sorry, that's very judgmental. <laughs> you can eat your oyster however you want. But just make sure there's an R in the month and, and you're fine. Um, I try to come to you each week. And the reason this cooking show appealed to me, and I think this being around Savannah too, which is around my home, is our spirituality and texts like we have this morning need to become personal. And I don't have all the answers. I went to seminary, I studied this stuff, but I have the answers that belong to me. What does this text mean to you and what do other texts mean to you? And I, I equate it to cooking. Cooking is a very personal thing, the smells and the tastes and what, what appeals to you and the love that goes into it. For me, interpreting scripture is just like that. And we have to have our own journey in interpreting scripture. Having mom and dad do it for us for our entire lives doesn't work. It's the way I'm looking at this. Can I get my next one? Leaving home is tough, especially because, and this is not everybody, by the way. Not everyone had a super wonderful childhood. And I, I don't want, this is not about you in particular. It's about all of us. But I do understand that some people wanted to leave home. And I want to be sensitive to that. Um, but let's just go ahead with this. In Savannah, my mom was 19 when she had me, and we had a little two-bedroom apartment in a black neighborhood. 
as a child in Savannah, there was just a sense of freedom here. There were kids on stoops and doors were open and everyone would just run to each other's houses. And you play old maid on the porch with your friends. After playing for three, four hours out in the sun, you would go to your neighbor's house to purchase these little popsicles. We call them thrills. And it's exactly how it sounds. It's thrilling to get a thrill. Then I would come home, sit around the table, and have dinner. My grandmother would be there, and she would have a pot of grits on, and then she would have fish frying in the cast iron. She didn't have a lot of money, but the way she cooked was tremendously generous. Cooking was a way that she just let us all know how much she loved us. I don't know about you, but I remember going into my grandmother's house. In fact, I used to, when I was little, get on the phone and I would sneak up to my parents' room. We didn't have cell phones back then. And I would get on the phone upstairs and I would call my grandmother and she would answer. I would say, Mamma, are you lonely? And she would always say, Charlie, I'm so lonely. I say, okay, good. I run downstairs and say, Mamaw's lonely, you have to take me over. And I would go over to Mamaw's house and she would cook a roast chicken and I would smell the smell of roast chicken and it was just smells like that. It smells like that that make it hard to leave home and make me emotional when I watch this and remember things like this from my childhood. What about you? Is this bringing anything back for anybody else? Um, Mashama and her family moved to New York City, so they leave. And she doesn't know what she wants to do, but her family is absolutely determined that she will go to college. I remember when I, I may have told the story, I came home my senior year in college and at Thanksgiving, my dad took me to lunch. He said, so what are you gonna do? I said, well, what do you mean? I'm coming back to work in the steel mill, uh, family business. He said, you can't come to work for me. And it was just absolute shock to my system. Absolute shock. And he said, son, you can't even get out of bed before 10 o'clock in the morning. If I were you, I'd join the military. So that was my leaving home. The Shama has a difficult time, as we'll see. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll just do what my parents did. I guess I'll just go into social work. Oh, boy, boy, I was just beaming. I was so proud of her. There was a point that she graduated from college. This was something that we wanted her to complete. I got a psychology degree and I started working with kids at this homeless shelter and that was super heavy for me. I just felt overwhelmed and I wasn't doing a good job. And then I got fired. shock to the system. That's when it set in that I needed to figure out what I wanted to do. As I said, as we go through scriptures together, when we're doing Bible study, we'll typically read a bit and I'll say, okay, what jumps out at you? 
I just think it's such a personal thing. And I think when Jesus says, hey, mother and father, he's getting us ready for, we have to be prepared to find out what we want to do, what we want to become in our own spiritual journey as well. Let's see where Michelle goes next. Lo and behold, I'm on a plane to France. I went to work at a chateau with Anne Willett. It was this beautiful castle on top of a hillside. We had herb gardens and vegetable gardens, and we went down to the market twice a week, and there was all this color. And I thought this was heaven. Living in this environment where you're completely connected to the ingredients, and slow, all day cooking. I just, soaked it up. Okay, how many, how many more videos do I have? One. So. Yeah, go ahead. So Mishama comes back now. Dijon and uh, I think it's going to be really good. The Dijon is so um, traditionally French, but then you throw cayenne and sorghum into it, and it's like... Yeah, it turns into something else. It turns into something southern. Yeah, I think yeah. so. When I was trying to find my business partner for the bread, I called Gabrielle Hamilton, and Gabrielle said, talk to Michama. And so I met Michama. We had an hour in the schedule, and I'm a very regimented guy. It's like five an hour is an hour. And four hours later, we were still together in a bar having drinks. And all we did was talk about food. It was almost like being with an old friend. <laughs> to bring that Valley in. Um, and the bridges. Did you ask me to make some Valley? I would like it. <laughs> I knew right there I wanted her to be my partner in the gray. I love the fact that we have things so under control here that we can just sit in a bowl of pasta and have a glass of wine. Your mouth is out of I think one thing that we're starting to see, and I don't know if this is true, this, see if this is true for you. As you start, as you become the person that you are, and the worldview that you are, and the worldview that you pass on to your children, if you have children, or pass on to other people, doesn't it seem to, as you've left home, maybe, and come back, You've been the naive wanderer that leaves and you come back wiser. But you have to bring the old and the new together to find a sense of wholeness. So that the things that your parents taught you, the traditions, don't become unimportant. They don't become something we throw away. They become very sentimental and real. But we latch our own experiences and our own opinions onto them to become who we are as an integrated whole child of God. See how Mashama takes that integration to the next step here. And then we've got one last after that. When I met Jono, I found out that the restaurant was going to be located in Savannah. And I was immediately intrigued. So I come down to be in the space, we get out the car, and I look up, and I can see that we're on Martin King Boulevard, across the street from where my parents got married in a city that I lived in for my childhood. We walked inside, and it was this old Greyhound bus station that was initially 
child, maybe, I don't know, maybe five years old, my mother took me down to the train station in Jacksonville, Florida, and I remember, I was born in 1965, so this was probably 1970, after the civil rights laws were passed, but I remember this, there were still signs that said uh, white and colored drinking fountains and white and colored restrooms. And I remember my mother telling me the story about why that was so and why that was wrong. And this, this really tugged at me uh, that she is taking something that was so horrible and negative and turning it into something positive and real for herself and for everyone else. And I also think about how those tables that used to be segregated, that now she is bringing her old experiences and new experiences and bringing everyone to the table, just like Jesus does. That's what struck me. We've got one more video, and I'll wrap this up. Learning about history, learning about the
for indulging me on a little trip home today. Um, as I wrap up, I remember when I was a child going up to the second floor of my grandparents' house and my grandfather took me into his bedroom and it's just as you went into sort of this foyer area there was a closet on the right. And he had a bag in there and he pulled the bag down and he pulled a coin out. There was a $20 railroad gold coin from 1800 something. I wish I knew who that coin was today. Because <laughs> I bet it's worth something. <clears throat> then he showed me his King James Bible. And he opened it up and it was a gift to my grandmother. And it said to my darling Lucille, the one person I love more than anyone I'll ever love, except for the one that I must follow until we meet again in heaven. That's counting the cost. That's counting the cost. I hope this meant something for you this morning. And I remember Craig talking about your experiences at Camp Sawtooth, where reading scripture, you would look at it as a child and look at it as an adolescent and say, there's more here. There's more here. And I would just say, don't be afraid to open up the Bible and ask questions and to confront texts like this with your experience and your worldview. I promise if you do, it will all come together. Amen.